Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. If you would, open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9 is where we're going to begin momentarily. Luke, the ninth chapter, as we open up the Word of the Lord for these next few minutes. And so whether you got a paper Bible or a digital Bible, it really doesn't make any difference to me as long as we're all looking in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 9. We'll be extensively in Luke this evening. In fact, that's where we'll just be entirely tonight. And so let's get those Bibles ready to go in Luke chapter 9. Great to see everybody tonight. And so... Glad to have the opportunity to be together. I hope you've had an enjoyable afternoon. It's just been a pleasant and beautiful day that God has given us as we inch closer and closer to fall. And man, it's just been a really good day. And I just count it as a, just a very unique privilege and honor to be able to spend another hour with you in, in worship unto God and in the study of His Word. And I trust that you're ready to get yourself into the Word right now as well. In Luke chapter 9, this is right at the height of Jesus' uh, great Galilean ministry when His popularity and His fame were arguably at an all-time high. We read this in Luke chapter 9. I'm reading in verse 7. There Luke says, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. And Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see Jesus. For the last uh, six months or so here at Lakeside, we have been studying in the Gospel of Mark on Wednesday nights. And we are near the end of Mark's telling of the good news. And in the course of that study, we have been introduced to just a, a cavalcade, a host of different characters, each of whom play a, a part and a role in the story of Jesus. One of the characters that we met briefly in Mark, in Mark chapter 6, is this guy that we just got done reading about here in Luke chapter 9. Herod the Tetrarch or Herod Antipas, or maybe you even know him as that old fox, Herod. This guy who just keeps popping up again and again and again in the Gospel of Luke. Why does Luke spend so much time, why does he devote so much real estate in his Gospel to this Herod fellow? Why is he so interested in him? You know, I preach all the time. And I find it very rare that I need to mention a political figure or name drop one of our governing officials, but Luke regularly talks about Herod and about what Herod is up to. Well, well why is that? Well, I believe that Luke observed and he saw some things in Herod's life that he wanted his original audience, and really Luke was originally writing for an audience of one, his friend Theophilus, he wanted Theophilus to understand some things about this man. And in turn, I think Luke wanted to share with us some important lessons that even we, his readers today, that we can learn from this man, from this very prominent member of the Herodian dynasty, this man who I'll remind you, he had a role in both the execution of John the Baptist and he had a role in the execution of Jesus the Christ. And so if Luke was interested and intrigued by this guy, then I'm going to be interested and intrigued by this guy. Let's see what Luke can show us about this fox, Herod Antipas. And I want to begin that by just noticing the passages where Antipas makes his various appearances. And that begins in Luke chapter 3 and in verse 1. In Luke chapter 3 and in verse 1, this is the first mention of Herod. Antipas in uh, Luke's gospel. In Luke 3 and in verse 1, the Bible records this. Luke 3 verse 1, In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iterea and Trachonitis, and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene. This is the passage where Luke is setting the date and the historical context. And he is providing, in many ways, the corroborating details that really would give credibility to what Theophilus is reading. What Luke shows here is that a great interest in Roman officials 
might be very fitting for that original audience because many people seem to believe that Theophilus might have been a governing Roman official himself. And it is from this passage that we know specifically which Herod we're dealing with. This is not Herod the Great. Herod the baby killer. We know about that Herod, don't we? Probably the most famous or maybe the most infamous of the Herodian dynasty. That's the guy who ordered the slaughter of all the baby boys in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. This though, this though is Herod the Great's son. This is Herod Antipas. When Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided amongst some of his sons. And Antipas, he got part of that pie. In fact, that's what it means for him to be a tetrarch. That is, he ruled over a fourth, a portion of that kingdom. And much like the rest of the Herodian family, Antipas became quite the politician and quite the schemer. For example, in AD 6, he went with a delegation to Rome, actually went with his brother Philip to go up to Rome to complain about his other brother Archelaus and the part of the kingdom that he had received. And in all of that political maneuvering back and forth, Tiberius Caesar, he gave Antipas the family name Herod. Now that was important because that was a dynastic name which means your son could then come along and rule after you. And while Antipas probably was pleased with that that gesture from the Caesar, what he really wanted was he wanted the title of king. Now, lots of people still referred to him as a king. In fact, there's even a reference in Matthew where Matthew will call him a king. There were people who treated him like a king, but he actually didn't have that rank. He didn't officially have that position technically as a tetrarch. He was more like a governor or maybe at best like a prince. In addition to being a noted politician and schemer, Antipas also was known for being a builder. All of the Herods loved to build. Herod the Great had been part of the big renovations that took place in the temple in Jerusalem. And his son Antipas, he was big on building as well. He was responsible for building projects at Sephora as well as the marvelous and majestic city of Tiberias which he ended up naming after the emperor at that time. All of that then brings us to what Antipas is probably most well known for, at least to us, and that are his interactions with John the Baptist. Now, Luke doesn't say as much about those interactions as Matthew does and as Mark does, but Luke does point out that Antipas was in an ungodly marriage and John came up to him and John said so. John had the gumption to just call it like it was. In Luke 3, drop on down in the text, look in verse 19. In Luke 3, verse 19, But Herod the Tetrarch, that's Antipas, that's the same guy, who had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that he had done, he added this to them all that he locked up John in Prison. It is, of course, that rebuke, and Mark 6 kind of goes into more detail about the the tales of that rebuke. It is that rebuke that ultimately results in Antipas ordering the execution of John the Baptist. And that is, in fact, what leads us back to that passage where we started in Luke chapter 9. Can we go grab that verse again? In Luke chapter 9, look there in verse 7 again. In Luke 9 and in verse 7, now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening and he was perplexed. Can I just suggest right here, when you see that Herod the Tetrarch stuff, maybe in your Bible, I've done this in mine, just put the word Antipas. It's kind of hard to keep up with all these Herods. This is Antipas that we're talking about. When he heard about all that was happening, he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. And Herod said, John I beheaded. But who is this other guy that I keep hearing things about? And he sought to see him. That's Jesus. And so we see here maybe some early signs that Antipas is interested that he is curious about this Jesus fella. But maybe even more than that, it does seem as well that Antipas is a little bit nervous about Jesus. He's a little bit intimidated by the things that he's heard about this famous preacher, this famous rabbi, this famous miracle worker. 
And so Antipas does what many in the Herodian family did whenever they perceive a threat to themselves. Well, they just decide, let's just kill him. That's what we'll do. Somebody's threatening me, then I'm just going to nuke him, just going to get rid of him. Let's kill the guy. Which brings us to Luke the 13th chapter. In Luke chapter 13, now, we don't know whether Antipas was really serious about killing Jesus here. But what we do know is that while Jesus was on His way toward Jerusalem, Luke 13, pick up in verse 31, at that very hour some Pharisees came and said to Him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said to them, You go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. And so Jesus gives almost kind of a, you know, kind of, kind of a tip of the hat to the shrewdness of Antipas. You know, I see your gamesmanship here. I see what you're trying to do, trying to run me out of town here. Not going to happen though. i got stuff i got to do. I'm here on a mission and I'm doing my mission. But Jesus knows. He knows that this will not be the last time that their paths cross. And that is what brings us to Luke the 23rd chapter. In Luke chapter 23, this is on the early Friday morning after Jesus has been betrayed, after He's been arrested, and after He has been tried by the Sanhedrin council, after He's been tried by Pilate the first time, and Pilate doesn't seem to doesn't find any fault with Him, doesn't seem to know what to do with Jesus, so he ends up hearing that Herod happens to be in town. And since Jesus being from Galilee, well, well that's Herod's jurisdiction, I'll send Jesus over to Herod. And let's see what happens when Jesus is sent over to Herod Antipas. Luke chapter 23, pick up in verse 6. In Luke 23 and in verse 6, when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he, Jesus, belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. Verse 8 now. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him. And he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but Jesus made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers, they treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in a splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with one another. You know, much like his other governing official contemporaries, Antipas is not interested in doing the right thing. He's not interested in justice. He has the power to do the right thing, but he doesn't do it. Instead, he just kind of mocks and roughs Jesus up a little bit, which it seems made him and Pilate strange bedfellows. This is what caused them to be able to to get along and to kind of become buddy-buddy. Now... I will add for you one final note that Luke records for us about Antipas. But he doesn't record it here in his original gospel. No, he actually records it in the sequel. And that, of course, is the book of Acts. Would you find Acts chapter 4? In Acts chapter 4, Luke makes note that the early Christians seem to think that Antipas was at least in some ways culpable for the death of Jesus, for the crucifixion of Jesus. I'm reading here in Acts chapter 4. Just pick up in verse 26. This is in the middle of the great prayer that Peter and John offered. In Acts chapter 4 and in verse 26... We'll pick up verse 25. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed... Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And so in the eyes of those early disciples, Antipas bore at least some of the guilt for the crucifixion of the Messiah. Now... We were able to read through all of those passages pretty quickly. And we were able to put together what I think is a pretty good little biographical sketch, at least from the Bible, 
of Herod Antipas. The question now is, what's the point of all of that? And really, that's a good question to ask whenever we read anything in the Bible. Hey, why is this here? What's the point of this? What's the point of all of this information that Luke has recorded for us about Herod Antipas? It seems to me that there is much more at work here than just a a, a passing reference to who happened to be reigning and at what time they were reigning. No, Luke goes into detail. Luke goes to great pains to show Antipas had particular interest in John the Baptist. And Antipas has really particular interest in Jesus. And he has lots of interactions with John the Baptist. And he has interactions with Jesus in those final moments leading up to the cross. I think there are some practical lessons that Luke is trying to convey to Theophilus and to us... And I want to highlight three of those ideas for us as we close this evening. Three things that are still beneficial even for us today. And that all begins with this first idea as we look at Antipas' life. And that is, number one, that being enamored with God's messengers, that is not the same as obeying God's message. That's important to see here. Would you go back to that verse in Luke 3? In Luke 3, verse 20 is the verse that said that Antipas had locked John up in prison. Well, okay, well, why did he do that? What was his reason for putting John in prison? Verse 19, Luke 3, verse 19. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that he had done. Does anybody else find that remarkable there? Anybody else find it remarkable that John had the opportunity to go and stand before what was essentially recognized as a king? You know, how many preachers get the chance to go and preach before a king or a governor or someone else of high standing and position? You know, I get to preach all the time, but I've never been invited to the governor's mansion. Never had the opportunity to come into the White House and preach to the president or to the cabinet. I'd like to do that, but that's just not likely to ever happen. Politicians and preachers, eh, they mix about as well as oil and water. They just don't mix at all. But John did get the invite. He got to go and talk to the Tetrarch. In fact, if you remember in our Mark study, Mark seems to indicate that John got to talk to Antipas often regularly. There was something about this eccentric preacher from out in the wilderness that Herod Antipas was just really, really intrigued by. In fact, go back to Luke 9 again. In Luke 9, because I think you see that same thing with Jesus. Hey, I'm just fascinated with these messengers of God, these guys who proclaim to be speaking for God. I want to hear what these guys have to say. Luke 9, look at the end of verse 9, where it says that Antipas sought to see him. I want to know more about this Jesus guy. And that's made even more clear when we come to that Luke 23 passage. Look there again. In Luke 23 and in verse 8, where it says, When Herod saw Jesus... He was very glad, for he had long desired to see him. Antipas was really enamored with God's messengers. But as I look a little bit more closely there at verse 8 in Luke 23, it seems as if Antipas wasn't so much interested in the message as he really was just interested in a show. Look at the end of verse 8 again. For he was hoping to see some sign done by him. There it is. There it is. Antipas thought that there was at least some measure of entertainment value in listening to these preachers. That hearing someone deliver God's word, that that was a way for him to to be amused for a little while, to be stimulated, to have maybe his emotions stirred and played with for just a few moments. And so, for example, here's John the Baptist. 
John walks around in those really weird clothes, camel's hair, come on. But here's this guy, he's kind of weird, kind of eccentric, he's got a fiery delivery, hey, let's get him in here. Boy, that guy, he'll just light the place up. I like to hear that guy. Or, you know, hey, here's Jesus. You know, here's somebody, there's just something magnetic about this guy. I mean, look, he's, he's got all these followers around him. Now, let's get him in here. Not only can that guy do some preaching, that guy can do miracles. Yeah, I love to sit and listen to that guy and watch that guy. And yet, despite all of that interest in arguably the two greatest preachers to ever walk the face of this earth, there is no indication that Antipas ever gave any serious consideration to obeying the message that he heard preached. He's enthralled by the messengers, but it's not plugged into obedience. Theophilus, are you getting this? That's what Luke, I think, is saying here. Theophilus, just because I've written you this long gospel, and just because you wade through and read all of that material, and just because you now know a whole bunch of information about Jesus, and yes, maybe you're really, really impressed by this Jesus guy, that is not the same thing, Theophilus, as you pleasing the Lord. That's not the same thing, Theophilus, as you obeying God. It's not enough just to be intrigued by the messenger, because if that were the case then Antipas would have been a disciple, wouldn't he? What makes someone a disciple is when they hear the call of the gospel and then they are moved to action and they are transformed by it. That's called obedience. I wonder then, I wonder how many young people have maybe convinced themselves that, well, you know, since I come to church all the time, and I've heard countless, I mean hundreds at this point, hundreds, maybe even thousands of sermons and Bible class lessons. I've been listening to that stuff ever since I was an infant. That that means I'm in the kingdom of God. That makes me right with God. I wonder how many grown-ups, adults, who attend worship services regularly, constantly, Maybe they even enjoy listening to sermons in their free time. Going to plug some sermons on my MP3 player or on my cell phone. Listen to a podcast while I'm exercising or while I'm driving in a car. I like listening to that. I'm interested in good preaching. Is it possible that those same people are mistaking listening and hearing, being interested in the Word, that they're confusing that with actually bringing their lives into conformity with the Word? I wonder sometimes as well if maybe we, if I, confuse daily Bible reading. And I'm talking about, and I know people who are consistent. They check all the boxes on their Bible reading schedule. They're diligent about getting that done every single day. I wonder if we tell ourselves that, hey, I read the Word of God, so that must be equivalent to, well, to being in a right relationship with God. Everything between me and God is okay because I heard His Word. What Herod Antipas teaches us is about the terrible folly of hearing and even being fascinated by the message without ever actually obeying the message. And maybe the reason that Antipas struggled with that is because he had trouble with this second truth. And that is that God's message, it reaches to every part of life. If you look at Luke 3 again, look at that verse. What was the issue there? Why was John rebuking Herod Antipas? Well, Luke 3 verse 19, he was rebuking him because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all of the other evil things that he had done. Now, Luke packs an awful lot into that one little verse because the issue with Antipas' marriage... His marriage to Herodias, that was actually a huge deal. It was an absolute scandal that set the tongues a wagon all across the Roman Empire. 
Antipas was originally married to the daughter of the Nabataean king. That is a kingdom that's just a little bit southeast of the kingdom that he covered and, and, and ruled over. And he was married to this Nabataean king's daughter in what was probably a political arrangement. But around A.D. 29, Antipas made a trip to Rome. And on the way, he stopped to visit his brother Philip. And when he stopped to visit his brother Philip, he coincidentally happened to fall in love with Philip's wife, Herodias. And she decided that, you know what, I kind of like being the idea of being married to a tetrarch. I mean, come on, that's, that's kind of one step away from being a king. He might make king someday. And so she decided she was going to leave Philip and going to run off with Antipas on the condition that he had to divorce his Nabataean wife. Well, his wife, his original wife, she caught on to that, caught wind of what they were doing. So she went home and she told her daddy, the Nabataean king, and the Nabataean king was very insulted. He ended up going to war over that. As I said already, it was a huge scandal. Can you imagine maybe one of our governors here in America maybe going to, you know, going to France and he's going to start sweet-talking the prime minister's wife and talking her into coming back to America with him? That would just be, it'd be all over the front page news, wouldn't it? That's the kind of provocative activity that Antipas was involved in. And John the Baptist showed up on his doorstep one day and he told him, Hey buddy, God isn't cool with that. God disapproves of your infidelities and of your activities. Which says that the gospel message, it affects every part of life. It does. It doesn't just affect our soul salvation. Yeah, that's a big part of it. But the gospel affects how we live, including our relationships and particularly marriage. And what Luke is conveying to Theophilus is, is, hey, Theophilus, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, then you're going to have to submit to the will of Christ in every facet of life. And that does include your marriage. Jesus is Lord. That means he gets a say. He gets a say in who you marry, and he gets a say in who you cannot marry. Now, Antipas, in response to the things that John the Baptist was telling him, Antipas could have made all kinds of arguments, and knowing Antipas, he probably did. He could have said things like, John, come on, man, me and Herodias, we're just, we're just so in love. I mean, we are, we're just like, we're, we're Twitter-pated, and we, we just got this instant connection, and we just love each other so much. He could have said, you know what, eh, yeah, you're right, John. Neither one of us, we probably shouldn't have divorced our original spouses, but, but surely God wouldn't want us to get another divorce. And so, so, so we'll just repent, we'll just say that we're sorry to God, and we'll just keep staying committed to each other. Or maybe Antipas could have said, you know, we're so happy. We are. We finally found our soulmate. And John, well, John, you're just trying to break up a happy home. Yeah, you're a homewrecker. Let's change your name. You're not John the Baptist anymore. You're John the homewrecker. But what John came to say was that our allegiance to God, it must penetrate, it must affect every facet of our lives. Which means, practically speaking today, which means that for people who maybe just kind of wish that the church would just kind of turn a blind eye, to matters of marriage and divorce and remarriage, they'd just rather we just not talk about that? The example of John confronting Antipas says otherwise. And for those who want to pretend that they can somehow be a faithful Christian and yet marry and divorce at will without any kind of ramifications, this story says otherwise. And for people who want to act like well, God just doesn't really care who you marry or how many times you marry or why you get a divorce. This story says otherwise. Listen to me very carefully. John the Baptist lost his life because he stood for and he spoke boldly about what God's Word says about marriage. It literally cost him his head. John understood what Antipas refused to understand, and that is that every single part of life, it is all subject to the Lord. 
that everything that we do, it must be governed by His will and His word. Antipas didn't like that. In fact, even today, when somebody brings bad news, what do they sometimes say before they deliver the bad news? They say, hey, hey, don't shoot the messenger. Antipas shot the messenger because he didn't like, and in fact Herodias didn't like, how God's message was pointed at them and it was disrupting their life. It was disrupting their everyday life. What Antipas' story is teaching us is that in order for Jesus to be the King of kings, the King of our life, then that means He must reign in every single part of our lives. Every moment, every day. Which brings me to this third and final observation about Antipas. And that is the importance of hearing and obeying God's message immediately. Because thirdly, those opportunities to hear and obey the message, those opportunities are not in an unlimited supply. You stop and think about it. Antipas got to hear John the Baptist preach personally. And not just personally, but regularly. I'd give good money for that opportunity. And that would have been some pretty good preaching right there. You know, Jesus said there was nobody greater than John. That's pretty high praise. Antipas got to hear God's message directly from the lips of God's messenger. And remarkably... It didn't change him. He did not act upon what he heard. He did not obey God's message. Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, he let them all pass by. But then one day, Antipas got what he must have thought was going to be the opportunity of a lifetime. He's going to get the opportunity to have Jesus of Nazareth Jesus, the self-proclaimed Messiah and the Christ, going to have Jesus standing right in front of him. Surely this one is going to be a game changer, right? Surely this is going to be where the message of God results in radical changes in Antipas' life. This is going to be where Jesus preaches Antipas right into obedience. Surely, right? Would you look in Luke 23? Antipas, he's eager He is excited about this moment. It's finally here. Luke 23, look in verse 9. He's so excited, he questions Jesus at some length. But Jesus made no answer. He made no answer. What do you you mean, Jesus? Jesus, this is the time to preach a sermon that will peel the paint off the palace walls, right? Why, when I see that Jesus is going to have this face-to-face interaction with this knucklehead, this bonehead, my thinking is Jesus is going to drop the hammer on this guy. He's going to bring Antipas to his knees through the preaching of God's Word. Nope. Luke 23 verse 9 says, Jesus made no answer. Chief priest, verse 10, scribes, they begin vehemently accusing him still. No answer. Verse 11, Herod and his soldiers, they start to jump in with the mockery and with the ridicule. Hey, do a miracle, Jesus. Come on. Hey, what? Say something. Cat got your tongue. What's the problem, Jesus? Made no answer. The temperature of the room would have no doubt gotten hotter and hotter and hotter and Jesus said not one word. Why is that? I'm going to suggest to you it's because Antipas had chance after chance after chance to hear and obey the Word of God. And after refusing again and again and again, Jesus closed the door on giving him any other chances. Jesus had nothing for somebody whose heart and whose mind was going to be continually hardened against the truth. Why would Jesus... Waste his breath preaching this great sermon when Antipas had already refused many great sermons. Why would Jesus preach to someone who is determined not to obey God's Word? 
God's verdict had already been decided. That if you're not going to obey what you've been given already, which was a lot, I'll bet, then you're not going to be given any more. Why should God bless a closed mind and a hard heart? Luke is pushing Theophilus to recognize that the gospel is not some intellectual toy that we get it down and we decide to play with it a little bit and we say, oh, okay, that was kind of fun and then we put it back up on the shelf until I decide that I want to play with it again. No, no, a thousand times no. The time to act on God's message is now, right away. In fact, if you don't do that, God will keep trying up to a point, but at some point... God decides that this is pointless and then in the words of Romans chapter 1, God will quit. God will give you up. That, that is frightening, isn't it? You know, people like to think that they can somehow be disobedient to God, just live any way they want until a day comes that I'll just finally decide, oh, you know what, I... I think I need to straighten my life out now. And Well, I sure I'm going to get me a preacher and he's going to stand right here in front of me and he's going to be handy and I'll just start doing what's right. But you know what? Antipas is showing us that it doesn't always work out that way. Jesus' silence in front of Herod Antipas testifies loudly that God's message is a use it or lose it opportunity. And Antipas, since he wasn't using it, he lost it. And his miserable example is still screaming at us today, some 2,000 years later. It's asking us, are you going to do better than this guy? Are you going to seize the opportunity to obey God's Word today? Or will you let it pass by, maybe for the very last time? Now... Antipas does go on to kind of an interesting history. But after Luke 23, at least as far as the Bible is concerned, he's done. He walks off the page of Scripture. Nothing more to be said about this guy. And and in some ways, it is really tempting for me to want to keep telling you the rest of his story as secular history bears out. But I'm not going to do that. Because Luke doesn't do that. Luke simply wants to tell the story of the gospel. Luke wants to talk about how the gospel of Jesus, it keeps moving forward powerfully and amazingly through the gospel of Luke, through the sequel in Acts, while characters like Herod Antipas, they end up fading into oblivion and into obscurity. In fact, in some ways... The only way we would even know all of these things about Herod Antipas is for the preacher to get up on a Sunday night and to preach a sermon like this. But I am glad. I am glad that Luke, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chose to record these lines about this man because Antipas does serve as a cautionary tale of what it means to hold the Word of God at arm's length and the terrible consequences of refusing to obey it. May His story move us to action and move us to action now. Would you pray with me? Let's go to God in prayer. Our dear gracious God, we humble ourselves before You this evening, thankful for another opportunity to open up Your Word. And Father, we are so thankful for the things that your servant Luke has recorded for us about this man Herod Antipas. Father, we delight and we joy to learn of of faithful servants of yours, to learn about John the Baptist and to learn about Jesus. But Father, we're also thankful that you took the time to write these things about the treacherous and the villainous people that occupy space in the story of Jesus so that we might learn from them. Father, help us as we think about His example. Help us, Lord, to never hold Your Word at arm's length. Help us, Father, to be hearers, diligent, excited hearers of Your Word. But even more so, Father, help us to be doers of Your Word. Help us, Father, to see the urgency of being a doer now, right now. 
And Father, we ask for your forgiveness when we fail in that way. Father, when there are things in our life that we have left undone, when there are things that we ought to do that we know we should, but we just don't do them, And Father, in other ways, when we do things that you have clearly said that we should not be involved in, when we sin and violate your word, we ask you to forgive us. We pray that you would instill within us a a fervency and and, and an eagerness to get back in the saddle, to come to you and to seek your help and to start living in a better way. We thank you so much for Jesus, the living embodiment of your word, how he's patterned for us, how it is that we ought to live our lives each day. And it is in his name that we offer this prayer. And amen.